What I want to do now is, is get right into our, our keynote speaker. Uh, we're going to hear from him, and then we've got some Q&A with him, and this is a treat. Uh, our keynote speaker for today is Laszlo Bach, surely a name uh, in Silicon Valley you've heard of. Laszlo, currently the CEO of Humu, a company making work better through science and machine learning. Uh, you are possibly familiar with his New York Times bestseller, Work Rules, uh, a book so relevant, uh, it was actually waiting for me at the breakfast table today, which is pretty cool. It's been published in more than 25 languages. From 2006 to 2016, Laszlo was the senior vice president of people operations and a member of Google's management team. Uh, he was growing that company, instrumental in growing Google, to more than 70,000 employees. During his tenure, Google was recognized as the number one best company to work for in the United States seven times. He is credited with starting the field of people analytics, the application of academic rigor, and Google-paced innovation to people management. It is my pleasure to welcome Laszlo to the stage. Thank you. Morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good. I was told I'd have about 90 minutes. Uh, does that sound about right? No, OK. <laughs> I love like half a dozen people are like, is he serious? <laughs> um, thank you for the very nice introduction and the education from the panel before. I, uh, I love the phrase that algorithms are the new middle management. Uh, and middle management sucks. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, by way of introduction, I, I have some prepared remarks, but thank you for that. The only thing I want to add is, is about the book. Um, thanks for having a few copies here. Anybody who wants is welcome to this one. Uh, I've donated all the money to charity ever since the book came out. So I've been able to donate uh, more than a million dollars to charities on the peninsula and in other areas. There's a great one called Peninsula Bridge uh, that we love in my family that works with kids from fourth grade all the way through high school. And they have 100% high school graduation rate and 100% college graduation rate. And it's because of this thing. Uh, but to set your expectations inappropriately, if you grab a copy, their bottom review says, this is a boring book. Um, and that's from my daughter, Annabelle Bach. Age five, so you roll your dice when you buy a book. So thank you again for the great introduction. Um, though I want to say just a few words about Humu. Um, our mission is to make work better for everyone everywhere through machine learning, people science, and a little bit of love. And I'm going to come back to that theme of love as I talk about culture and building great cultures here in Silicon Valley. Um, what we do is we help people make better decisions and take better actions at work and by nudging them, by driving small changes. Because what we believe and what we've seen is that it's really hard to change human behavior at scale. What's much easier, and this goes back to, again to the wonderful comment Vaughn made about education should be about booster shots, is that small interventions can shape behavior and have a massive, massive impact that makes people more productive, happier, and creates more inclusive organizations. But I want to come back to why I'm here, both for this discussion and here in California. I was born in communist Romania in the 1970s. And we snuck out and came to the United States and specifically to California as refugees. And it was because of what this country stands for. We came from a place where there was constant government surveillance, constant government propaganda, state-owned media. Uh, might start sounding familiar. Um, to a place of trust and of opportunity. And the reason we came here was my dad, my dad, whose first memory in 1945, his first memory is hearing the Voice of America, the radio channel, speaking and saying, the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming. And he knew since he was four years old that he wanted freedom, he wanted to be here. Because he knew he wanted two things, freedom and warm weather. So California was clearly the right place to be. But California is also a special place because of the tradition of regulatory innovation. We lead the country in clean energy standards. We lead the country in things like same-sex uh, marriage and legalizing things and, and setting up civil rights. The Sanctuary City program here in San Francisco is a model for the entire world. Um, and as a founder building a team, this part of the country also has the highest concentration, not just of brilliant people, but we've discovered kind people thoughtful people, people who actually care about the community. So culture is key to this, to building great companies, to what makes, I think, San Francisco special. 
And over the past two years, it's really been fascinating to watch the technology companies that have taken the most heat for their cultures go public and get hammered. And I, I take no joy in this, right? But there was one company that had a famously bad culture. They went public over a year ago. Their stock's still down over 30%. There's another company that went public more recently that had a famously tough culture. And even though they've been improving, their stock's down 20% just in a couple days. So culture matters. And at the same time, you've seen companies with a strong mission or companies that have a stronger, more inclusive culture. Pinterest was one. They're up 50% since their IPO. <clears throat> Beyond Meats, sustainable, vegetarian-based meat products, they went public last week. They're up 165%. And it's hard to explain that purely based, it's actually, you can't explain that based on their economics. It doesn't make any sense based on their economics. But they have a culture and a promise that's something greater and more important. So all of this makes company culture even more critical today than it was when I was working at Google. So I want to talk today about what each of us can do to make culture impactful and meaningful. But I want to start, and caveat, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I want to start talking about love a little bit. And I want to quote from 1 Corinthians, uh, which for those who are confused, I know some people in Washington are, is not actually 1 Corinthians, but it's 1 Corinthians. <laughs> and the verse goes, and you've all heard this at weddings, love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't boast, it is not proud, it is not self-seeking. Those words written thousands of years ago are core to a great culture. And what I want to talk today about is how you actually make that culture real and bring a little love into your organizations and transform organizations and the community around you for the better. There are three trends that are converging to put culture on the top of every single company's agenda. The first is what's internal has become external. So back in the 1980s, consultants and researchers started talking about corporate culture for the first time. And they started talking about the personality of organizations and what it was like. And what they discovered was organizations are way more homogenous than the societies they live in. They're less diverse. Their decision making is more rigid. They operate under certain principles which don't reflect the broader society. But culture was an internal thing. There was no glass door to rate your CEO. There was no LinkedIn to help your competitors ransack and pillage your best talent and steal them away from you. <laughs> that was inside the company. But those days are over. So if you look at my alma mater, Google, 20,000 people protesting. That's a big deal. That's an external thing. Resignation, Alex Stamos, the head of security at Facebook, resigned in protest over some of their practices. Um, you see this in the Catholic Church. You see all kinds of examples of companies' internal operating styles spilling over into the outside world and people caring about that. In the digital area, there's no way to hide what's internal from the external world. And that matters because how people think about your organization is everything about whether you're perceived as a villain or a hero. So at Google, Google always did brand research on what drives Google's brand. The number one thing that drives Google's brand, at least while I was there, was it was viewed as a great place to work. Not that it's easy to use, not that it's helpful in your daily life. It's a great place to work. So that attracts people, but you've got to maintain that. Number two. The research on culture is in, and I mean the academic, verifiable, replicable research, and it shows that there's a real impact, economic impact, to having a great culture and a real cost to having a lousy one. So what we've seen at Humu is that strong and good cultures have better bottom lines. So we've seen employees not just become happier, but for example, in a call center, 13% more productive as a result of making culture stronger. And that's as measured by first call resolution rate. So this isn't some, you know, I was a consultant too. It's not some made up number. It's what proportion of calls are resolved the first time. And it was a 13 point improvement, which is an incredible improvement. We've seen employee attrition in high turnover environments drop by 42%. And it's all about the environment you create. Uh, I learned last night, uh, well, somebody not at Amazon shared this. So take the, the data point with a grain of salt, but they said Amazon's uh, fulfillment centers have an annual employee turnover rate of 600%. 600%. So the average person is there, you know what, a couple months? And this person who worked in one, he has a startup called Winolo, which is all about helping people find jobs the next day. So these are lightly skilled jobs, so it's pick and pack, it's, um, it's a whole host of jobs. So he actually worked in an Amazon fulfillment center, and he said, oh, you can tell the difference. There's lights that go off if you're you know, not hitting your quota. People are highly measured all the time. There's no thought to the environment created for people in the culture, right? 
So this stuff actually, actually matters. Uh, the most inspirational work on culture came from two researchers. Um, I'll give you a quick summary. One is Amy Rosinski, who's a professor at Yale. And she did work with housekeeping staff in hospital systems. And she went in and she tried to understand how they felt about their work. And she found that in a coma ward, where the patients are non-responsive, there was janitorial staff who were principally made up of black women who had at best graduated high school. So these aren't like Yale grads, these aren't like sophisticated people thinking about culture, and these aren't physicians, these are just people. And what some of these women were doing were they were taking paintings off the wall in some of these rooms and moving it to other rooms. And Amy said, why are you doing that? And this woman, a housekeeper, a janitorial person said, I feel like I'm helping the person heal by changing the environment. And Amy said, that doesn't make any sense. They're, they're in a coma, so first of all, they can't see it. And second, you get fired. Your job is to change bedpans, not to move the furniture and paintings. And this woman told her, I don't care, because my mission is to help these people feel better, to help them heal. This woman's risking her job to do something she thinks is right to take care of these patients. So what Amy found is in across professions, no matter what, doctors, lawyers, nurses, janitors, housekeepers, butchers, bakers, whatever, only about a third of people find meaning in their work. And so that's true of your companies as well. The thing is, Adam Grant, who's a researcher at Wharton, found that if you can connect people to meaning in their work, they're on average 21% more productive, which again is consistent with what we've seen. And there's a lot of ways to do that. What Adam did in a number of cases was he had people who were impacted by the mission of the company come in and spend five minutes a month just saying, here's what your company did for me. So retelling those stories again and again has a tremendous, tremendous positive impact on culture. And the really cool thing is when you make people aware of what really matters, not only do they see it in the organization, they change and they grow and they get better. So one company we worked with, this is a quote, just because I, and I'm only sharing it because it, I, I was stunned to see it. I value that we're looking closely into our culture. I'm starting to see some changes. Though we've had the saying, be kind, and there are no smart jerks, I realize that I have been inconsiderate and rude and overly competitive and confrontational frequently in the past year. I'm glad we're taking a closer look. If you hold a mirror up to people, they want to get better. Nobody wants to be a jerk. Nobody wants to be terrible. So culture done right gives you an immense, immense opportunity to, train, to change your organization, but also to drive incredible economic benefit. So it's a beautiful double bottom line thing. The third thing that's converging in terms of culture is that finally technology, people technology, has advanced enough to be able to, to actually do some good. Um, we no longer need to make decisions just based on our gut. Because trusting your gut on people issues is what got us into problems in the first place. It's how you end up with discrimination. People like to hire people who look like themselves and work with people who look like themselves. It's how you end up with bad bosses. I know what I'm doing. I've been managing people for 20 years. And it's how you end up with workers who are checked out and disaffected and don't go the extra mile for your customers. So I'll prove it. Um, raise your hand if you think your gut instinct is better than most of the people at your table. Okay, hit one, but he took it right back down. <laughs> now everyone's throwing biscuits at him. Uh, so it's a trick question, but if you take it out of this room, 90% of people think they're above average drivers. We all think we're above average managers, better at peering into people's souls. The fact is we're not. Because if we were, we'd look at our teams and they'd be the best teams in the world. And on average, our teams are average. In fact, there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. A couple of researchers named Dunning and Kruger, University of, Min I think, Minnesota, they discovered that the less competent you are, the less aware you are of your incompetence. <laughs> so the more you believe your gut is, should be relied on, the less you should probably rely on it. So what does that have to do with technology? For the first time ever, you can actually know what's going on in a way that's not filtered by someone else's perception, and instead something that relies on data that you can trust. So the, the combination of computer science and people science and a strong foundation in ethics and privacy, which was alluded to before, can actually help leaders make measurably better and more fair decisions. Uh, and I'll talk in a second about like, how you assess and evaluate that, because a lot of technology can actually do harm and can discriminate and cause you to make worse decisions. So where does that leave us? We've established culture as a tool that you can use to drive performance that people can tell outside your company, if your company is great or a disaster culturally, and that computer science plus people science can help. So what should you do? I propose four things. 
Number one, employers need to actually invest in culture. Cultural failures among large companies have been the biggest destroyer of economic value in the last five years. And I'm not gonna call companies out, but there's, there's companies in our area where you've seen stock prices get hammered, people get fired. Uh, bad things happening to lots and lots of people because cultures were broken. And every CEO and every head of HR, human resources, will tell you culture's a priority. But for far too long, we've been given only a blunt set of instruments. Fire somebody, swap out the leadership team, revamp the board. So there's an opportunity to actually invest in this using the right instruments. But it's an investment, and most companies don't think about it that way. You know, I may be biased, but the HR department's always the poorest department in any company. And that tells you something. Because your human capital spend, your payroll expense for almost every company is one of your top three line items. And companies don't invest in it. Or they do, but in the wrong way. So number one, you need to invest. Number two, you need to invest differently than you do today. So employers have been surveying their workers for years. And it works kind of the same. Gallup talks about how employee engagement uh, hasn't moved in the last decade. People aren't any more excited because they're getting surveyed and then kind of sitting around going, what do we want to do, right? You need better insight. You need to invest in better things. Uh, the same thing is true of training. So one company that, that I know, they have 50,000 employees. They spend $100 million a year on training. $100 million. Which sounds like a lot, except it's $2,000 per person. 2,000 bucks per person, a lot of Bay Area companies spend that. They did a study of the return on investment. They found it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't help. So it's neutral. They should stop. Why spend $100 million on something where there's no evidence it works? So point two is scrap the programs where you don't have hard evidence they work. And they're going to be ones people love. I love going to training classes. So much fun. You get to sit around a round table, and there's snacks and bean bags to play with. And I enjoy it. It's a waste of time and money, most of them. You instead should look for programs and technologies where you can measure the behavioral change and business outcome. And then you should experiment. Try one for six months or a year. If it doesn't work, get rid of it. And tell your employees you're going to be trying new things until you get things that actually help them. Third, make some noise. One of the biggest lessons I learned being an executive at Google was if your company has a brand that people care about, and most of you do, speak up. Raise your voice. If you think black lives matter, as I do, get that message out. Because you got to remember, when Nixon resigned, 22% of Americans still thought he was doing a great job. So the companies that stand up now that stop trying to be all things to all people will be remembered and rewarded by customers in the future. And finally, a little bit of advice when you go back to the office, going back to mission and love and these things. The best single thing you can do when you get back to work today is tell people thank you. One of the biggest drivers of culture is gratitude. And whatever it is, be specific. Share that with people, because that'll create a ripple effect. And to go back to the quote, love always protects, always trusts, always hope, always perseveres. Love never fails. And the right union of caring for your people and a little bit of love and a little bit of proof that what you're doing works will transform your cultures for the good. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, welcome Scott back up for a conversation. Thank you. Thank you.